Focus Day is a podcast from a female-founded destination practice that believes that crisis isn't an if, it's a when. We are an organization unafraid of crisis, but have never known one to be resolved in a single day. However long the day or night that gave rise to the crisis in the first place, there's always something we can learn. I'm Leah, the founder and CEO of Broadstairs Consulting, a problem-solving consultancy offering crisis and governance advisory services to help leaders and organizations thrive and flourish. We operate in the gap between legal and public relations, at the coalface of difficult situations, believing that most crises are avoidable and the impact of inevitable ones usually can be mitigated. Our guests have overcome a litany of crises. Many of our guests have worked with us in some capacity in the past. All of them have stories worth hearing. We trust them to make this worth your while. We hope it helps you trust us. Dr. Leroy Logan, MBE, is one of the UK's most highly decorated and well-known black police officers. A highly respected and well-regarded commentator on policing and wider social justice issues, he believes that there is still much work to do in creating a more equitable and fair criminal justice system. Leroy's early career was recently depicted in Red, White and Blue, the BAFTA and Golden Globe winning episode of director Sir Steve McQueen's acclaimed Small Axe series. As the founding member and past chair of both the Met and National Black Police Association, Leroy Logan also co-founded Voyage Youth, a citizen's focus of the BPA. As a social justice charity, it aims to empower marginalised young black people and provide them with the self-awareness and motivation to transform themselves and their communities. In 2020, Leroy released his first book, Closing Ranks, My Life as a Cop, which is a fascinating read. Leroy, we are absolutely delighted that you've agreed to be interviewed today. So welcome to The Longest Day. Thank you very much for the invite. So let's dive straight in. How would you describe your longest day? Um, Very traumatic, very tough. Um, But because I anticipated it, it wasn't a shock. Um, But I suppose like everything, you just have to be ready for these things, especially as a black person speaking truth to power and not compromising. I suppose that is um, par for the course. I was uh, a chief inspector actually based around here in Westminster. So I was uh, chair of the Black Police Association as well. And one of my members was being investigated for every allegation bar murder, I think it was, and terrorist. It, it was easier to say what he hadn't done than what he had done. So the backdrop was I hadn't sort of cut him off on a limb and let him free fall. I basically said that innocent until proven guilty, the cornerstone of British law. But knowing that would put me even more at risk of any sort of pushback. And it could come back in come back in so many ways. But one of the ways I knew there was a a real high probability of that happening was around my activity in the Black Police Association. So I'm on this uh leadership course. There was an irony in that. I saw I'm at a leadership course outside London and um my fellow chief inspectors were all on this course and the lecture, that afternoon lecture, it was a Friday afternoon, it's the last day of the course actually. Um, and I get this um, request to leave the class to go and meet someone in the reception. Oh, And um, so I go to reception and the officer in the case for my BPA members investigation was also there. He was the one that was saying to me, well, you know, he's guilty, you know, he's, he shouldn't be trusted and all this sort of stuff. You know, if you can make a statement to that effect, I said, no, I'm not. I mean, you do your investigation. Um, if in the process of the investigation, you want me to speak, uh, I'll make a statement if necessary. In the end, it, I didn't have to, but the fact that I wasn't, um, we were rallying around him on the cornerstone of British law, instant to approve you. So when I saw him in the reception and I thought, 
Uh, it's in the book. His name is Barry Norman. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I need to um, serve a misconduct notice. I said, well, I knew it wasn't good news seeing you here. Mm. Uh, you haven't come all the way from London to come and give me glad tidings. So I need bad news. And I said, can we go somewhere quite private? So he did. But because I was set up, everyone knew some. And because it was so high profile, media wise, everything, everyone knew something. And he said, I, I came here to just say so it wouldn't be done in the Met. I said, you might as well announce yourself with, uh, you know. It's like those legal shows, isn't it, where they come yeah. into the lobby and serve you a subpoena yeah, uh, yeah. in front of everybody. So I think to myself, okay. So we go in this private room and he says to me, um, well, when you were national chair of the Black Police Association, which was in uh, 98, 99, um, you illegally submitted an application for application for refund of expenses, an expenses claim that um, you shouldn't have. And uh, I was baffled. I mean, th that baffled me. It wasn't the fact that I thought he was going to say, oh, it was seen in certain areas, you know, in a suspicious way or something, but an admin issue. Mm. So I didn't make any comment because I didn't know really what he was getting at. He was saying that I claimed for a hotel bill, which I shouldn't have. So I said, well, I, I, I just put in application forms and if they, I can be paid for it. I am. If I'm not, I'm not. Invariably, I never did claim that much because I felt I was in a privileged position as national chair. And then I went on to be in London chair. And in fact, I was London chair when this mis misconduct notice was put on me or served on me. And so I always felt that was a privileged position, you know, cover my out of pocket expenses, but all the subsidiary expenses, I just bothered. Anyway, he, um, he tells me that and I said, okay. And that was my only comment or some words to that effect. Uh, and he said that, um, you know, we, we hope that uh, we can get this done, sorted out pretty quick. So that was bad enough. Um, so I didn't go back to class. Uh, I thought, well, there's only a couple, of, not even a couple less, maybe one lesson left. I thought, I'm just going to uh, pack and go because I'd driven down. So as I'm, I gave him excuses uh, for obvious reasons. In fact, Barry said he would do that as well. Very nice of you. Uh, and it was a Friday, so I thought, well, I can just try and gather my thoughts during the weekend. But as I'm driving back to London, I turn on the radio, and it's on the radio that a public official has been served with a misconduct notice or something like that. That, um, and he's the chair of the Black Police Association. It's Leroy Logan. <laughs> Completely. Um, and I thought, this is trial by media. You know, guilty until proven innocent. So I must have been on this gold group. And they said, well, you have to um, offense to the best defense type of thing. And because we had kept them on the defense with, with the whole issue uh, regarding my member, um, Ali Design and all of the issues to, to ensure that he, he was investigated properly and we weren't adding to the problem. So here we are. So I, I'm, I'm now listening to this on the radio. So I, I called home and I said, listen, Gretel, you might be um, hearing things on the radio or on the TV, but this is what's happened. And she said, well, bound to happen. This is when having a strong partner, strong family, um, strong wider friendship group really kicks in. Uh, and I got a couple of calls that, from, from some friends saying, oh, by the way, I just heard this on the radio. What's that big? You know, uh, it, it eventually ma made the, the TV uh, during the weekend. But I wasn't prepared for the way they would do it. Okay, fair enough. I remember him saying, integrity is non-negotiable. Um, and I thought, 
hmm, I wonder how that's going to pan out. And eventually, I was investigating. But I think the, the, the real pain for me is having to explain this to my family and, you know, give some context. So I wasn't shocked, but that for me was the most painful thing. And I knew it wasn't going to stop there. It was going to have other sort of impacts on the family. And I thought, well, I must be doing something right. You speak about this so eloquently in the book. I, I'd love you to share how your family responded as you were talking through some of these things with them this weekend. Well, you know, got the family around and, and, and explained to them that I was the chair of the National BPA. I went to Manchester to launch of the Manchester BPA. Uh, and, and the real irony was, uh, again, another work of fate was my wife would work in this city at the time. I said, I need you to come to this event. Oh, why? 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 I said, I just feel that you need to come. And it was a really, really important factor because she could clarify what was happening, what was background noise, what was things I was trying to deal with. And um, she helped me to just go through all my records during the weekend and she mapped it all out. Um, and she said, you haven't claimed for all these expenses. Why not? I said, I just didn't see the need to. I wasn't that desperate for money, really. <laughs> <laughs> all the subsistence payments and everything. Uh, when we figured it out, I said, well, if they're alleging me that I illegally put in an 80 pence, uh, 80 pounds rather, expenses claim for a hotel bill when I shouldn't have, well, actually, the Met owes me about two grand. <laughs> so that's one thing in my favor. So that really helped me. Um, and also, because Gwell was with me, she could not be an alibi or anything like that, but be a person in the room with me at the time and she knows um, the conversation I was having with the receptionist um, when we were checking out um, about the fee for the room and she recalls me paying for it and and so that really helped because you know when you've been to so many launches and so many things everything is a bit of a blur and I was coming to the end of my tenure as national chair because I only just wanted to do the first year and I thought, I'll, I'll put in all my claims all in one, in a bulk thing, which wasn't the best thing to do, but it was just time, because I was still, when I was national chair, an inspector in the Met, so I had my day job, mm -hmm. and this was on top. Um, so, and then, obviously, that was in 99, and so three years later in 2002, it's good that I kept meticulous records, because... It gave me that clarity that I felt more confident of. So you know, I'm not my brow. I think, wow, that's a bit of a relief. Um, yeah. And you know, Gretel being there really just gave me a sounding board of reassurance and comfort. And again, she thought it's bound to happen at some stage. Mm -hmm. How long was it between excusing yourself? on the Friday afternoon from the conference um, or training to actually being in the room, being party to an investigation? Um, to being interviewed? Mm. Uh, it was um, only a few months because one of the things, this was the other thing, uh, quite interesting. My, my lawyer at the time was a guy called Sadiq Khan, who was the current mayor. And he had, got involved in the Ali Desai case um, and uh, he was drawn to us basically and I think he was making a name for himself. He wanted to, you know, we, we were like a movement that had presence and, and it was getting things done and people could see witch hunts were looming and we were part of that witch hunt. And so he 
wanted to make a name for himself in his law firm. So he said he would be our lawyer pro bono and everything. So it fitted in really well when I'm, I'm now being investigated and, um, he said, yep, he would be our lawyer. So it, it was, sometimes these things can drag out for over a year, two years, whatever. But uh, the first thing we, we emphasized that this thing had to be done expeditiously because it's not uh, a major allegation. It's quite minor when you think about it. But the law is the law. And so we have to have due process. But you have to think of, we in the BPA had already classed it as a critical incident. And with that, we want it expedited in a timely fashion. So it's a matter of uh, a few months we've been full documentation of what the allegations were and we had drawn together our papers and at the same time we we knew that the Met had put themselves between the rock and a hard place. They set themselves up because they were just making so many assumptions about Ali, myself, our movement, the BPA and um, and as I'm London chair at this time I, I've got a real helicopter view of what uh, the issues are and how to outmaneuver them. It's like a game of chess, really. And so Sadiq, and he's a sharp lawyer. Don't get me wrong. He knows his oats. And um, we put in an employment tribunal at the same time. So it's running parallel. So this is where the Mets in a rock and hard place. They've got an ET and they've got this investigation, which is going nowhere. And at the same time, we're asking them questions about the ET and oh, we, we had 200 questions or something ridiculous. And they were under pressure. You could feel it. To add to it, so this last sort of three or four months goes into six months, the media is starting to turn in my favor and the community are really coming to my side of things, the support and the allyship. It wasn't just the black community. I was getting it from all communities, um, people I've worked with in the past, people who could, you know, sympathize, empathize, um, identify with the cause. And I was really encouraged by that. So. When we got the final notice that the case papers were going to CPS, we were already, um, no, actually before that, when we're going to the investigation now, I get a call from a couple of senior officers and I was shocked. One of them said they want to be my supporter. Cause normally if you're going to have a supporter, it's a similar sort of rank. To you. Mm -hmm. John Greaves came out of nowhere and he said, Leroy, um, I want to be your supporter. I said, really? He said, yeah, I can, I can see what's going on. So we got the weight of public opinion moving now. And the, the core to public opinion was added to by the support of John Greaves and he didn't have to do it. And I actually, I felt sorry for the investigating officers who had to interview me. Because I walk in, Steve Carr on my left, John Greaves <laughs> on my right. <laughs> I actually felt sorry for the um, interviewers. And, and, and so <laughs> at no stage did I feel any sense of concern, fear. I wasn't being arrogant about it. I just felt so reassured. Um, I had my records to verify. I had that um, support of my wingmen and, you know, my, my faith kicked in. So I wasn't surprised that I felt so strong in my conviction because this was my commission. This is the thing that I had to do. This is the whole reason why I joined the Met in the first place, you know, to make change from within. And if I have to be on the receiving end of the injustice, then so be it. I was prepared for that. But it still was painful. How did the matter come to conclusion? Well, after the interview, I 
ensure that the papers were submitted quickly because it was having such a fallout for the Met. And I said that, you know, the BPA would have some counter actions about this because we can't allow my case, Ali's case, and so many other employment tribunals and civil actions and officers uh, being subject to discipline um, and investigation. In fact, at the time, you're three to four times more likely to be investigated if you're black and you're white. And, and the other thing is, um, when I checked with, out the blue, that's right, after the investigation, I got some information. Uh, around the same time as the interview, I had some in information from Ali. And you know, you report yourself, because we supported him. I don't know where we got this information from, that white officers, a whole series of white officers in specialist operation had put in false claims repeatedly. All they got was words of advice. And here I am, one claim, which is an admin error. And they're throwing a book at me and giving me, you know, integrity is non-negotiable. Well, it's obviously non-negotiable if you're black, because those white officers. So when I was producing this in our documents, it just blew it apart. To the extent that the CPS said there's no case to Dean Face. But it was really good that Matthew Ryder Casey was there, part of the legal team, and that Sadiq had set up. So if it went to court, I, I was in good shape. And I was looking forward to my day in court, actually. So I said something masochistic about that. <laughs> I, I suppose, the, again, the only fallout is in between the interview. And the CPS make the decision. My youngest son went to school, and he was at secondary school at the time, I think he is seven or eight. And he said, um, oh, dad, I was in the playground and other boys uh, and girls were looking at this paper. And I was like, what is that? And it showed Leroy Logan investigation pending or results investigating pending. And they said, I'm going to go to prison. I'm a criminal. I'm going to go to prison. And it, it threw me um, when he came back from school and, and shared that with me. And I, uh, I, I didn't expect it from that standpoint, from my youngest. And it really pained me. Uh, that I, it reduced me to tears, actually. Privately, I, I was so upset. I said, don't worry, Miles. It will get turned around. Dad is not going to prison. This is just newspapers. Um, making things exaggerate. Anyway, it ends up that um, the CPS throw it out. The media, to be fair, did show a lot of, um, yeah, they published it. Maybe not on front page like the, the, the allegations against me, but at least uh, a couple did. Guardian was really supportive. Hugh Muir, uh, Vikram Dodd, all these people. They were really positive. We'll continue the interview after a short ad. It's hard not to feel disillusioned by the fashion industry. To get that piece you want, you either have to compromise your budget, compromise the product quality, or compromise your ethics. But we believe there's a better way. Positive Retail brings you secondhand designer fashion that offers more than just a new fit. Our goal is to categorically change customer perceptions of resale and provide joy, protect the planet, and create community. Find us in stores in Margate, Ramsgate and Deal and online at positive-retail.com. That was Anna, founder of Positive Retail. Thank you. Let's get back to the interview. You said many times that you weren't surprised that this eventually happened to you. What do you think you learned about yourself? That even though... Um You feel capable of dealing with most things, whether it's because of your expertise or your understanding of how things can play out. And but despite that strength of character, which had got me through joining the Met, despite my dad being beaten up over traffic matter. It got me through training school with the support of my dad in the end. 
it helped me to go through the toxic culture again, and the N word written on my locker as a trainee constable in isn't to my first station. That strength of character still got me through to promotion and supporting my dad through his civil action around the beating, the unlawful arrest and excessive force. It got me through, you know, to sport him and I was in uniform at the civil action to do that. It, it pushed me through all of these things, you know, with the help of my faith. It's what God showed up. I remember saying from the very early, very early stages in my career, you don't have to be a forensic scientist to know when God shows up. DNA is all over it. It actually helped me develop and understand other people's plights much more. Even though I was, I, I was understanding that from the early stage of my career, because I know that I was arresting people I went to school with. And I said quite clearly, if I didn't have the parents I had, there's no way I could have been in their position. I don't know. So it just sort of assisted me to know that I had to go through that journey. I had to be intentional. I had to be purposeful. I focus on, on how the Lord wanted me to, to do these things. I'm a, a lot of people think he's a religious nut, but, and I think that's why I wrote the book. So I just felt that, you know, in honoring the Lord, he'll honor me. So every time I honored him, per pushing through and, and not taking the easy option. Because the first line of my book is, your worst nightmare can be your biggest breakthrough. And I I've been living that, joining the map, all the incidences, and leading up to that investigation. So I knew was, there was growth, and I knew there was a strength and a desire to continue going. And I suppose that lives with me now. Well, that was what I was going to ask. Uh, obviously, you're retired now, but you haven't lost your sense of purpose. In fact, some might say that you've renewed your concept I'm more of radical than I was <laughs> 30 years ago. That's the real thing. Um, but I, I, I think in my retirement, I still want to do uh, advocacy work, activism. I'm still doing um, work in charities, um, seeing young people develop uh, through Voyage Youth. I helped set up um, 20 odd years ago. People still seeing that I'm consistent. They might not like what I say. There might be a grudge and respect, but they can't say I'm not consistent. I, I'm a bit of a parrot, really. You know, <laughs> just talk about these things because it's in my DNA. And I, I, you know, public service, you can't switch it off. I, I, it's something I do. And, um, and someone's got to do it. And I'm not saying other people are not, but I think I've got a unique lens and a unique voice that no one can gaslight me and say it doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, I do I attract trolls, but it's less since the book and the film because I don't think there's much they can come back with. Because I in the book, Closing Ranks, which I see on that shelf there, <laughs> um it it's warts and all. I haven't tried to paint myself as this perfect guy. I'm far from that. If I can do what I've done, other people can. I am but I know I've got this strength of character, this warrior spirit in me, which I like to think I'm a gentle warrior. I don't um, take advantage uh, or, or, or inappropriate. Uh, I have got the discipline to know my boundaries um, and, and be there for people wherever I can. Um, sometimes Gretel says, you put yourself on offer too much for people. And I don't know. And, and I know sometimes I got to learn the word no. Um, I find it really difficult even now, but I'm getting better. Well, gentle warrior though you may be, one final question for you. On your longest day, I imagine you were not particularly hungry because it was a pretty stressful day. But if you could have chosen any food to fuel your longest day, to fuel that process of preparation to be a warrior, what would it have been? Well, you know, the, when that happened was literally um, six months after my mother died in 
September 2001. And I was desperate for a home call. I was so desperate for uh, some real jerk chicken and rice and peas. And the, the way she cooked it is, you know, Gretel does it, everyone else does it, but there's something about her mother's cooking. Uh, I just couldn't. I was desperate to hear a voice. I was desperate to just say, Mom, what did you do? <laughs> um, and my dad was still alive, bless him, and he gave me as much support as he could. Um, and I suppose the, the real sad bit about it is he died the f following September, a few months later in September 2002, and the case hadn't been complete. Um, so that, that he went to his grave knowing that his son was being investigated. But he also knew that you were innocent. Oh, yeah. And he also knew yeah. your character. And Absolutely. he also knew that you are that warrior. And look where it's Yeah, and, ended he, up. He, and he prepared me for that. You know, um, his strength of character, mother's strength of um, purpose, um, really awesome mix, really prepared me for that. And so, you know, I know that they're pleased with... Um, not only how I responded to all of that, but how I built uh, on things, and, and I still am. Well, we've absolutely loved having you here on The Longest Day. It's harrowing to hear what can happen um, in a life committed to public service. Um, but your book is filled with twists and turns that are absolutely worth the ride. Uh, I couldn't stop reading. Um, so I highly recommend getting a copy of that if you get a chance. And we look forward to seeing what you do next. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I've never really uh, gone into this as in-depth um, for since the book. But, you know, I've never had that conversation about that, that day in such depth. So thank you very much for that. You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next instalment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2023. Production copyright. Broadstairs Consulting Limited. All rights reserved. <laughs>